John chapter 3. The Gospel of John chapter 3, a very familiar passage. Um, we'll be reading verses 1 through 18 as our scripture background reading as we look at the Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 56 on the forgiveness of sins, what we believe and what we confess there. The Gospel of John, starting at, uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 1. There was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to Jesus by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher come from God, for no one can do these signs that you do unless God is with him. Jesus answered and said to him, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus said to him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born? Jesus answered, Most assuredly I say to you, unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said to you, you must be born again. The wind blows where it wishes, and you hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from and where it goes. So is everyone who is born of the Spirit. Nicodemus answered and said to him, How can these things be? Jesus answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and you do not know these things? Most assuredly, I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is, the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Our song of preparation is number 514, O Love That Wilt Not Let Me Go. Number 514, I believe that's a familiar tune. Is that, yeah? Okay. And let's rise to sing the four stanzas of number 514.
At this time, I'll invite you to turn with me in the Forms and Prayers booklets to page 223. Page 223, where we find question and answer 56 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Page 223. We're still uh, dissecting or taking apart the Apostles' Creed. We're looking this afternoon at what we believe when we confess every Sunday afternoon in the forgiveness of sins. Question 56, we're asked, what do you believe concerning the forgiveness of sins? This is our answer. I believe that God, because of Christ's satisfaction, will no longer remember any of my sins or my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. Rather, by His grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ that I may never come into judgment. Church of Christ, if you watch the news every night, um, you'll remember maybe Monday night, I think it was, that a Canadian man uh, was convicted of uh, drug tra trafficking in China, and he was sentenced to death. And he had actually been previously sentenced to 15 years in prison, but his case was retried, and the, the judge decided to apply the death penalty to him, which prompted Prime Minister Trudeau to accuse China of uh, using the death penalty arbitrarily, he said. That is, um, he accused them of doing something just because they could. Um, no rhyme or reason to it. Uh, the suspicion, of course, is that this is China's retaliation for Canada, Canada's arrest of a Chinese national, uh, the daughter of the um, owner of Huawei and all of that stuff. Um, and it, it probably is. It most likely is some kind of retaliation by China. Don't mess with us and don't touch our citizens and so on. The thing is, and, and where they have everybody over a barrel is, China is within their right to execute a drug trafficker. That's in their laws. And so they really have no obligation to extend mercy or to forgive this person. No matter what lawyers say, it's in the law. He broke the law. He was trafficking in, dr in, in drugs. The penalty for that is execution. And so they, uh, they pretty much are within their right. And that's the risk that you take if you violate the, the laws of another country. If you go there um, and you, you break the laws, then you can very much be uh, subjected to the most extreme punishment, whatever it may be that is their punishment in that country. And we begin this way because we're looking this afternoon at our confession in the, in the Apostles' Creed, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. And we're talking here about God's forgiveness of us. That is, His willingness to pardon us for wrongs that have been committed against His holy majesty. And His law, by the way, is even more strict and more unbendable than China's. We confessed in question and answer 11, way back when, that His justice requires that sin committed against His supreme majesty be punished with the supreme penalty, which is eternal punishment of body and soul. You know, or in other words, an eternity, an everlasting death in hell. That's what violating the law of God requires. And because he is holy, because he is just, he is, uh, this demands that he um, bring this punishment to pass. And yet, it is our joy that every Sunday afternoon, we may confess together the forgiveness of sins. It's a huge relief. Uh, we can utter a sigh of relief every time we make that confession. It's a reason to rejoice that our death sentence has been lifted. Well, how is that possible, and what does that mean for us? These are the questions that we will explore this afternoon as we look at question and answer 56 under this theme, we joyful believers proclaim our assurance of our forgiveness. We joyful believers proclaim our assurance of our forgiveness. And we'll see that this forgiveness includes two things, absolute acquittal, and in the second place, absolute purity. But as we joyful believers proclaim our assurance of our forgiveness, we see in the first place that this forgiveness includes absolute acquittal. And the word acquittal, boys and girls, is just a big fancy word that means that somebody is let free, that they are released of all charges, they're cleared of all charges. I heard a story one time of a family who had a dog, and they suspected that that dog was somehow sneaking into the house and stealing food from the kitchen. And being farmers, of course, that dog's end was uh, coming down the road very, very quickly, without a doubt. 
And it was like the death sentence had already been pronounced upon him. It was just a matter of time until one day, one member of the family came into the kitchen suddenly and they saw the cat on the counter and they realized who the real culprit was. And so the cat went and the dog stayed and he was acquitted of all charges. They realized that the dog was not really guilty. He had been charged uh, without any real evidence. Our confession is that we have been acquitted. We have been released from our guilt. We have been completely pardoned, completely exonerated from our guilt. The difference between us and that dog is um, it's not that we have been accused wrongfully. We're guilty. We have bitten the hand that feeds us. We have been disloyal to the one who has given us everything. We have openly disobeyed his law. We have refused to do what he commands and to do what he forbids. We have accepted his gifts daily and returned little or next to nothing. And that's why this confession that we make every Sunday afternoon is really so amazing. Our confession, as answer 56 reminds us, is that God will no longer remember any of my sins or my sinful nature, which I need to struggle against all my life. And so we're confessing here when we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins, we're confessing here that God, our Father, has willed not to punish us for the wrongs that we have done. He has chosen not to pardon us and to, to place upon us the punishment that we really deserve. He will not impute to us, he will not ascribe to us any of the wrongs that we have done against him. In effect, he tears up the paper with all the charges written upon it and throws it out. And he, he brings us, he comes down into, into death row and he unlocks the, the gate and he brings us out and he takes us to the gate that will take, take us to the outside and he says, there you go, you're free. That's what he's done for us. And notice that the catechism reminds us of two things of which we're guilty here. Our sins and our sinful nature. Both things, by the way, are abominable before God. Sin, as the Apostle John reminds us, is lawlessness. It's a breaking of God's law. It's rebelling against the law of God. Sin is a form of treason. It's any, uh, sinning is any act of rebellion against God's authority. The Bible uses words like transgressions or trespasses. Sometimes it's translated to describe sin in the Bible. Um, and a transgression, as we said this morning, is crossing the boundaries that God has clearly laid out. In the U.S., as you know, President Trump wants to build a border wall to keep illegal immigrants out. There's always been borders, but people keep sneaking into the country, transgressing, hopping the fence, going where they're forbidden to go. And that's what we do every time we sin. We transgress God's law. We ignore his admonition to stop, no trespassing, and we continue to kill with our anger and our hateful words. We steal, we covet, we lust, we lie, we trespass against God. The Bible also speaks of us committing iniquities against God. That's sins against God that he doesn't deserve. Again, he loves, he gives, he blesses each and every day. What do we return? Disobedience, rejection, retaliation against him. We push against him, we uh, kick against the goad. It's disgraceful, really. The Bible also uses words to uh, describe sin like wickedness, breaking covenant with God, godlessness, injustice, mischief, unrighteousness. All of these describe the sins that we commit against our God each and every day. But these all stem from, and this is the second thing that God is, uh, uh, that we are guilty of, it, oh, these all come from the sinful nature. We have become corrupt in light of the fall. Originally, as we've seen before, God created us in true righteousness and holiness, but we disobeyed God in Adam and have now become infected with sin. And so as early as Genesis 6, verse 5, we hear that every inclination of the thoughts of our hearts is to want evil continually. We are corrupt in that way. We have a sinful nature. The Bible describes us as having corrupt hearts, poisonous tongues, carnal minds, all offensive to God. And yet we joyfully confess the forgiveness of sins. And again, we ask, how is that possible? 
Well, the Catechism reminds us, as it faithfully summarizes scriptural teaching for us, because of Christ's satisfaction. And that word satisfaction is, is from old, it's an Old Testament language, from the Old Testament systems of uh, animals being taken to the temple or the tabernacle and being slaughtered and their blood being poured on the altar to make satisfaction or make atonement for the sins of the Israelites. That's what Jesus has done for us. He has made satisfaction for us. He is the Lamb of God who has taken away the sins of the world. He has, by giving his own life for us on the cross, appeased or quieted the wrath of God against us by his death. He paid our debt. The book of Isaiah, in 50, chapter 53, says that Jesus was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Our sins were laid upon him, and he was punished for our wrongdoings. He bore our sins and carried our sorrows. And here's what we have to understand. By confessing that God has forgiven us for all our sins because of Christ's righteousness doesn't mean, and this is where it becomes very serious for Christ anyway, by confessing that, it doesn't mean that God has given up his right to punish. It doesn't mean that God has given up his right to punish. God didn't say at some point, oh well, what are you going to do? Let's just, you and me, agree to disagree. You can't change. You can't obey me perfectly. So what am I going to do? I'm, just, I'm not going to hold it against you. I'm just going to turn a blind eye. I'm going to pretend that you, you are not sinful against me, and I'm just going to let it go. That's not what God did at all. Certainly not. Because, again, that would be against his just and holy nature. Sin must be punished. There can be no pardon for sin. But what did God do? Instead of punishing us, he sent his only begotten and beloved son into the world, and he sacrificed him on, in our place. And now the promise is, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. God provided a substitute, one who was made like us but sinless to stand in our place. And so he could be condemned on the cross and he could bear our curse and he could free us, he could acquit us. And this acquittal that we have received through Christ is absolute. Every sin is paid for. Every debt is covered. If we believe in Jesus, the promise is that we shall not perish but have eternal life. Paul writes in Romans 8, verse 1, that there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. The blood of Jesus Christ, God's Son, John writes in his epistle, cleanses us from all sin. He who believes in him is not condemned. True for us now are the words of Psalm 32, where we confess in verses 1 to 2a, Psalm 32, Blessed is he who trans whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man to whom the Lord does not impute iniquity. And again, uh, that does not mean that God turns a blind eye to our sinning, even before or after salvation. The Catechism wisely reminds us that we all need to struggle against our sins all through our lives. And so not only do we have the good news proclaimed in the New Testament, in the Gospels and the Epistles, we also have very strong calls to fight against sin, to put to death the old sinful nature, to not tolerate even a hint of sin, to rid ourselves of hatred and anger and blasphemy and filthy language and lying, laziness, selfishness, pride, covetousness. These we are now to consider enemies. It's not for us to say, well, now that the blood of Christ has washed me clean and I am forgiven in the sight of God, now I'm free to indulge in my sins. That's not the case at all. None of these sins are to be tolerated or indulged in by us. But let's be honest, not one of us here would be able to say that we're able to live in perfect obedience, even after conversion, even after knowing all of these things. Every Christian, every day, feels a measure of guilt as you think of the things you do and say and thought 
you feel amount, a certain amount of regret, you feel even shame at times when you have to bow your head before a holy God to pray, thinking back on perhaps things you have done in the day past. And I hate to break this to you, but uh, speaking to the younger people, it doesn't get better with age. A dear brother, years ago in his 70s, I remember, said to me, you know, I thought it would get, uh, as you get older, your struggle with sin would become less and less, but it doesn't. It doesn't really get better. If anything, as you get older and the more sanctified you are, the more aware you become of your sinfulness. But brothers and sisters, here's the good news. If we are believers, if we have truly trusted in the Lord Jesus Christ as our Savior, there is comfort. We may know that we have forgiveness. We have absolute acquittal before the sight of God. And that's not where it ends. It actually, become, it actually gets even better. And that's what we want to see in the second place, as we joyful believers proclaim our assurance of forgiveness, that this also includes absolute purity. In the second part of that catechism answer, we said this, Rather, by His grace, God grants me the righteousness of Christ that I may never come into judgment. Now, if up to this point we've thought that this is an amazing confession, prepare to be further delighted. This part of the confession is like getting a huge bonus check that we weren't expecting, that we really shouldn't expect. God also, not only does He forgive us for the sake of Christ, He grants unto us the righteousness of Christ so that we then stand righteous in His sight. And this, in fact, answers the question how a holy God can forgive and unholy people. How does he do that? How can he do that? By first giving them holiness. He clothes us in the rich robes of Christ's righteousness. Theologians use the word imputation. It's a big word, but a fancy word, but very rich and very deep. And imputation simply means that God the Father takes from the righteousness of Christ, his Son, and he gives it to us. He credits us Jesus' perfect righteousness. It's, boys and girls, it's like if uh, in catechism class, the teacher says, well, if all the kids do their memory work and all of you can say perfectly, then I'm going to give candy to all the kids. But then it turns out that just two or three of the kids know their memory work really well, and the teacher says, you know what, because these two or three made such an effort, I'm going to credit their uh, obedience and their hard work to everybody else. So everybody gets candy. Now, boys and girls, don't think that I'm hinting I'm going to give you candy on Tuesday. No candy on the way. Uh, but uh, you get the point. That's what imputation simply means. There's a simple explanation for imputation. Giving to somebody else what really rightfully belongs to another person. By the imputation of Christ's righteousness, we are able to stand righteous before God. Now, just to go a little bit deeper, and I ask that you stay with me because... You understand I can't keep you on the bottle all the time. I have to feed you steak at times. To go a little bit deeper with this, talking about imputation, what has been imputed to us? What is this righteousness of Jesus that has been imputed to us? Here's what. Uh, Jesus earned that righteousness on the basis of his uh, active, what is called his active and passive obedience. I mentioned that this morning. His active and his passive obedience. What do we mean by these terms? The active obedience of Jesus simply refers to what he did, what he accomplished in his life. Okay? Uh, it simply refers to the fact that in every way possible, through all his life, Jesus obeyed God's law perfectly. That was the active obedience of Christ. The passive obedience of Christ refers to what was done to him, what he took upon himself. That is our punishment. He paid the wages of sin, which is death on the cross. And so through his active and passive obedience, he has attained a righteousness that is perfect in the sight of God as our representative, and that righteousness has now been given to us, credited to us. And so when we speak of God granting the righteousness of Christ, we're saying that he takes from Jesus' perfect obedience and he gives it to us. He clothes us with that perfect obedience. And apart from that righteousness, which is credited to us, 
it would be impossible for us to, to meet the standards of a holy God who is just and perfect. And so we could summarize the gospel message this way. First of all, the requirements for acceptance with God is perfect righteousness. Okay, we understand that. God is holy, God is perfectly righteous. The requirements to be, for, to, to be accepted in his sight would be, of course, perfect righteousness. Second thing we need to know is that this requirement cannot be met by us. We are sinful. No matter how hard we try, we cannot attain perfect righteousness in the sight of God. The third thing we need to understand is that the eternal Son of God took on our flesh for our sake, and he accomplished what we never could which is perfect righteousness. And the fourth thing is that God the Father grants or credits or imputes that righteousness to us. That's how we are saved. That is how God is able to achieve John 3.16. The believing here, whoever believes in him shall not perish, uh, re includes receiving Christ and being clothed or covered in his righteousness. And in such a way, we are made acceptable to God the Father. And only in this way. Paul writes in Philippians 3 verse 9 of his desire to be found in him, that is to be found in Christ, not having my own righteousness, he says, but that which is through faith in Christ, which is from God by faith. In 2 Corinthians 5 21, he writes, God made him who knew no sin, again, speaking of the Lord Jesus Christ, God made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him and listen to Romans 8 verses 3 to 4 for what the law could not do in that it was weak through the flesh God did by sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh on account of sin he condemned sin in the flesh that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh but according to the spirit brothers and sisters it is only on this basis that we may boast of the forgiveness of sins because of what Christ has done, because of what God has done through his son, Jesus Christ. Because God has granted us the righteousness of Christ so that we don't have to stand in our own righteousness, which we, we don't have anyway, we may then be addressed as children of God, saints in Christ, holy and beloved, as sinful as we are, in Christ, God, God grants to us absolute purity. Notice as well that the Catechism reminds us that God does this by His grace. It's not a matter of us earning it. Grace is, is undeserved favor. God gives to us what we do not deserve, what we have not and cannot earn. It's pictured wonderfully, the grace of God, that is. It's pictured wonderfully in the parable of the prodigal son. You remember that story in the Bible, the parable of Jesus? He abandoned his father, abandoned his family. He abandoned his obligations as a son in the house, as a child of his father, and he goes off to live for himself. And he abandons himself to wild living, and he blows all the money that, uh, that his, he inherited from his father until he finds himself standing in a pigsty longing to eat the food of the pigs. And then he comes to his senses. And he realizes that he could go back to his father and seek forgiveness. And by right, really, there should have been no entrance back into his house for him. He should have been cut off forever from his father's love, from his father's concern. But when he comes to his senses and he returns, what happens? He's welcomed with open arms. That's what our Heavenly Father does for us. He receives us as His own, even though we do not deserve it, unconditionally, by grace. Boys and girls, that's what it means when we sing, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to Him belong. They are weak, but He is strong. That's what we're talking about. We are all weak, but Jesus is strong, strong enough to save us, and He does because he knows that if he left it to us, we are too weak to save ourselves. Nowhere says it better than Ephesians 2, verses 8 to 9, for by grace you have been saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, 
lest anyone should boast. By grace, we have attained righteousness in God's sight now and forever. Through Christ, we will never come into judgment. We heard it in our passage. Whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Neither in this life nor the next will we ever come under God's condemnation as believers in his Son. Never ever will we be held accountable for our sins. When we believe in Jesus, God casts our sins into the depths of the sea. He will remember them no more. Clothed in the purity of Christ, we have become absolutely pure in the sight of God, and we always will be. We'll end with these words again from Psalm 32, verses 3 to 5. David writes, When I kept silent, my bones grew old, through my groaning all the day long. For day and night your hand was heavy upon me. My vitality was turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledge my sin to you, and my iniquity I have not hidden. I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the iniquity of my sin. As sinners, we can relate. We know the relief that comes when we cast our sins upon Christ and we experience his forgiveness. And if you don't have that, and if you have not experienced that sense of relief that your sins have been forgiven, brother or sister, I urge you not to deny yourself this, because you are denying yourself great joy and great relief. A lot of stress and anxiety is taken off of you. Confess Jesus and possess that joy and peace beyond what we can ever ask or expect. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, were it not for your mercy and grace upon us, we would have no right to come into your presence. We would have no right to even call upon your holy name. You are a holy God. Your eyes are too pure to look upon evil. Before you, the wicked cannot stand. Sin committed against your holy majesty must be punished with eternal punishment of body and soul. And yet, you have not left us to our just condemnation, being within your right to punish us to the full extent of your law, you have taken mercy upon us. You sent your son Jesus to stand in our place and bear our punishment. And you have taken his righteousness and you have placed it upon us so that we may be called saints in Christ and holy and beloved. Help us to rejoice in this. Help us to be thankful for our salvation and help us to live out of that thankfulness. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Number 431 is our song of application.